BestBookBits.com brings you the book summary of Food of the Gods, The Search for the Original Tree of Knowledge, A Radical History of Plants, Drugs, and Human Evolution by Terence McKenna, published in 1993. An exploration of humans' symbiotic relationships with plants and chemicals presents information on prehistoric partnership, societies, the roles of spices, and spirits in the rise of the dominant societies, and the politics of tobacco, tea, coffee, opium, and alcohol. Why, as a species, are humans so fascinated by altered states of consciousness? Can altered states reveal something to us about our origins and our place in nature? In Food of the Gods, ethnobotanist Terence McKenna's research on man's ancient relationship with chemicals opens a doorway to the divine and perhaps a solution for saving our troubled world. McKenna provides a revisionist look at the historical role of drugs in the East and the West, from ancient spice, sugar and rum trades, to marijuana, cocaine, synthetics, and even television, illustrating the human desire for the food of the gods, and the powerful potential to replace abuse of illegal drugs with a shamanic understanding, insistence on community, reverence for nature, and increased self-awareness. Most people are addicted to some substance and, more important, all people are addicted to patterns of behavior. Terence McKenna Who was Terence McKenna? Terence McKenna captivated the attention of the post-1960s counterculture. He was a lecturer, author, and ethnobotanist, which means he studied how specific plants shaped human cultures. In this book, Food of the Gods, which is also his most popular, he reveals a theory that psychoactive plants may have catalyzed the explosion of the human brain over 3 million years. This happened at the speed scientists are still astonished by. It was this growth in the intelligence that allowed us to successfully spread across the planet and now sit at the top of the food chain. However, this success came at a cost. With modern cities and technology, people feel more alienated than ever. This is exemplified by the ever-rising rates of mental illness and the use of pharmaceutical drugs. There is also a tremendous destruction happening to the oceans, rainforest, and planet. McKenna says that reawakening our relationship to certain psychoactive plants may help us pull us out of these negative trajectories by allowing us to experience the interconnected relationship between us and nature. It is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Aristotle some parts of McKenna's theory will probably turn out to be incorrect as future scientific and archaeological evidence is uncovered. However, his ideas stimulate and provoke many to think in novel and unexpected ways, and they might do the same for you. Number 1. Human-plant relationships shape culture and have done so for millennia. In the Gobi Stream National Park, which is Tanzania, East Africa, Scientists noticed a chimpanzee tribe doing something very weird, yet fascinating. By the way, this is the same place Jane Goodall became famous for her long-term study of chimps. The scientists saw that one type of leaf kept showing up undigested in the chimp poo of the tribe. So they wondered, why would these chimps be eating leaves they couldn't digest? And the story gets stranger. Every 10 days, the chimps would wake up and instead of going to their normal breakfast fruit eating spot, they walked more than 20 minutes away just to find these undigestible leaves, which the scientists noted were from the Aspelila plant. The chimps would pick off an Aspelila leaf, roll it around their mouth for a minute, then swallow it whole. They repeated this with about 30 small leaves and then left. This behavior was a huge mystery to the researchers until one day, they heard about two new discoveries related to the Aspelia plant. First, a biochemist at UC Irvine called Aloy Rodriguez had discovered a chemical in Aspelia leaves called thyrubin A. At the same time, Neil Towers at the University of British Columbia was studying the same oil but coming from a different plant, and he found thyrubin A acted as a strong antibiotic, killing bacteria and also help getting rid of parasitic worms in the intestinal tract. Now the chimp's strange behavior was starting to make sense. What if they were eating the leaves as a kind of herbal medicine? The scientists wondered if the native people living near the park also knew of the leaves. As it turns out, they did. 
they use the leaves to treat wounds and stomach aches. What's even more mind-blowing is that the native people only use leaves from three of the four local Asperlina species, and these were the same three species used by the chimps. For thousands of years, our relationship to plants have shaped human culture in deep ways. Just like some chimps will walk out of their way to get medicine leaves, we humans have a rearranged vast empires to access certain plant substances. But just like a goldfish can't see the water it swims in, these plant relationships are so fundamental to who we are that we're usually not aware of them. Let's look at sugar as an example. The European sugar fixation. Even to the 1600s, sugar was a rare and luxury commodity in Europe. Except for some kings and nobles, most people have never eaten sugar. Then, in the 1700s, sugar became cheaper and it became available to middle class for the first time ever. And, as soon as people got a taste of it, demand surged. According to the BBC, average sugar consumption in Britain rose from £4 per person in 1700 to £18 in 1800 and to £36 in 1850, a massive increase. Around the same time, tea, coffee and coca also started being imported. They became popular because of the taste, because they're all stimulants and because they're all boiled which helped them stop the spread of waterborne diseases which were a big problem at the time. Another important fact is these substances are bitter, so people drank them with lots of sugar. The craze for coffee, tea and coca reinforced the craze for sugar, and in just a couple of hundred years, these four plant substances went from being almost unknown to being consumed by everyone. Also important, they became the basis for entire trade empires and military fleets. By 1750, sugar made up one-fifth of European imports, even more than grain. To satisfy the huge demand, dozens of plantations were established in the New World, especially the Caribbean. The first indentured labourers who worked there were white, but they kept getting sick from diseases like malaria and yellow fever. Soon, needing more workers and ideally ones who wouldn't drop dead of tropical diseases, they soon switched to slaves from Africa. It's estimated that at least 10 million people were brought across the Atlantic. On ocean voyages alone, between 8 to 18% of them died. The rest were forced into a degrading life of hard labour. It was a dark chapter in human history. Despite centuries of Christian moral conditioning, Europeans easily turned a blind eye to the wholesale kidnapping and transportation of millions of people to satisfy their newfound taste for sweet cakes. The slave trade continued for over 200 years until slavery was finally abolished in 1807. Now, a worldwide sugar addiction. Yet today, sugar has only become more popular. Average yearly sugar consumption has multiplied to over 160 pounds per year per person. According to the USDA, on average, we now eat over 10% of our calories from added sugar. And let's be clear, sugar is totally unnecessary to the human diet. People survive for hundreds of millions of years without it. It's nothing more than a kick. Looking at the graph, you can see the adjusted US per capita refined sugar consumption and the amount consumed going from the years 1970 to 2006. In the US, high fructose corn syrup is becoming a popular sugar substitute, largely due to corn subsidies. Let's also notice for a moment that sugar is not a harmless kick. It's responsible for tooth decay and obesity, and studies show that countries with the highest sugar consumption also have the highest rates of type 2 diabetes. Yet we still can't resist picking up one more cookie if it's sitting on the table. Why is that? Most of us would say it's because sugar tastes great. A deeper explanation comes from scientists who have found that daily bringing on sugar releases dopamine in our brains the same way addictions to hard drugs are formed. Yet in our culture, we put sugar in the food category and kids happily consume it daily, often showing emotional outburst or distress if they can't get their fix. Coffee, a behavior altering drink. Now let's switch gears and talk about coffee, another substance that feels essential to daily life. 
64% of Americans drink coffee every day, often more than one cup. And on average, we spend over $1,110 on coffee every year. Saying you were addicted to coffee and need it to function has become a predictable joke. Nonetheless, coffee fits the definition of a drug because it is a stimulant and changes how one feels and behaves. Caffeine suppresses tiredness and makes one better able to focus on repetitive boring tasks. That's probably why coffee is one of the few psychoactive substances not only tolerated but encouraged by modern capitalist culture. In 1952, a Pan American Coffee Bureau ad campaign broadcast the message, give yourself a coffee break and get what coffee gives to you. Overnight, the term coffee break was born. Industrial unions were soon negotiating for coffee breaks to be written into every new union contract. And today, it's almost impossible to imagine what the modern office worker culture would look like without coffee. Yet you may be surprised to learn that the earliest evidence for coffee drinking only goes back to about 500 years ago. In the Middle East, coffee was first drank by Sufi mystics who used it as intoxication and to aid concentration while repeating the name of God. Soon, coffee houses were springing up everywhere, including in Mecca, where people energized by coffee passionately discussed politics. Coffee was actually banned there in 1511 by the more conservative and orthodox imams who worried the drink stimulated radical thinking, although this order was soon overturned by a higher level of government. Banning coffee on fear for of revolution sounds a bit crazy, yet their fears may not have been totally unfounded. Terence McKenna observed that coffee may have stimulated French people into a revolution only a hundred years later. Coffee was introduced in Paris in 1643, and within 30 years, there were over 250 coffee houses in the city. In the years immediately preceding the French Revolution, there were nearly 2,000 coffee establishments operating. If wild talk is the mother of revolution, then certainly coffee and coffee houses must be its midwife. What's the lesson here? Coffee, like sugar, looks innocent on the surface. Our double mocha soy macchiato from Starbucks helps us get throughout those dreary Monday mornings a little more easily. Yet when most people collectively start drinking this stimulant, it's no exaggeration to say coffee reshapes our culture in its own image. By enabling and reinforcing certain behaviors, coffee helps us get focused on boring work a little faster and makes our speech a little more feverish. What would the world look like without sugar or caffeine? There'd be no McDonald's, no Starbucks, or any other fast food restaurants or coffee shops. And we've only looked at two plant substances out of thousands that shape our society. Now here's something else to think about. What if in the forgotten past, we had relationships with other plants that shaped human culture in radically different directions? Number two, pre-humans may have consumed psilocybin mushrooms on the African savanna, accelerating our evolution. We humans have the largest brains in the animal kingdom. We humans have the largest brains in the animal kingdom in proportion to our body size. Yet, our brains actually used to be a lot smaller. Then in the past 3 million years, human brains tripled in size, with the fastest growth happening between 800,000 and 200,000 years ago. Scientists are still unsure on how our brains grew so big, so fast. This is a big deal because our larger brains allow us to be, well, human. Everything that is uniquely human about us stems from our cognitive ability, including language, painting, poetry, sports, religion, politics, and music. To put it into perspective, the brains of our closest animal relatives, the great apes, like chimps, gorillas, and baboons, their brains barely changed size in the past 10 million years. Looking at the image, you can see we have the age millions of years ago throughout Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Americas. Estimated history of the ancient human species, only Homo sapiens are left. So why did our brains grow so big? Some scientists believe cooking is responsible. When humans began cooking, it allowed us to consume more calories with less energy needed for digestion. Our intestines became a lot shorter and a lot of that new excess energy was diverted to our brains. However, other scientists say 
widespread use of fire for cooking only happened after our brains had grown a lot. In other words, cooking was the effect of being smart, not the cause, but nobody is really sure yet. There is another theory that looks very promising. Some scientists noticed that the fastest brain growth in humans happened at the same time that climate was changing most rapidly. So they speculate times of climate fluctuation put large pressure on humans to develop a bigger brain that helped them adapt to a rapidly changing environment. In plain English, if the forest you're living in suddenly shrinks and you're forced into the grasslands, you'd better be smart enough to find new ways of putting calories in your mouth or you die. So the smartest, biggest brained and adaptable humans lived and passed on their genes. Did psilocybin mushrooms grow on the ancient African savannah? Now here's where Terence McKenna steps in with his own guess for what caused the brain growth. He says when climate change did force their ancestors from forest to grasslands, they were suddenly surrounded by hooved herbivores. Considering how many prehistoric paintings feature bison, they were likely an important food source. And this also means coming into constant contact with the manure of these animals. You may see where this is going. Some hallucinogenic mushrooms prefer to grow in cow manure, including psilocybe cubensis, a dung-loving species of what we colloquially call magic mushrooms. If there were psilocybin mushrooms growing in ancient African cow pies, then would humans have tried them? It's very unlikely. Unlike the panda that only eats bamboo, humans are omnivorous animals and our dietary flexibility is the main reason why we're so successful in every environment. From jungles to deserts to arctics to tropics, certainly mushrooms would have been noticeable to a hungry wandering ape with their unique shape and inviting smell. Psilocybin could have been given pre-humans three specific advantages. Now, Truth McKenna also says psilocybin mushrooms would have given proto-humans three key evolutionary advantages. Number one, first, because small doses of psilocybin slightly enhance visual abilities. This was shown by a scientific study in the 1960s by Roland Fisher that found people who consumed a low dose of psilocybin could detect more quickly when previously parallel lines became skewered. To hunt or foragers, enhanced vision would have been very useful, giving them an edge in spotting food and avoiding predators. Number two, second, slightly larger doses of psilocybin stimulate restlessness and arousal. As McKenna says, wearily stimulated arousal in apes leads to what a scientist might describe as more instances of successful copulation, another slight evolutionary advantage. And number three, finally, at high doses, psilocybin introduces a transcendent state, a state where profound self-reflection occurs. Many people report feeling a sense of unity and an interconnectedness psychological boundaries dissolve in. From the outside, these altered states of consciousness may be labelled as simply drug-induced hallucinations. Yet, maybe the experience shouldn't be brushed aside so quickly. Roland Griffins of the John Hopkins University began the first modern scientific studies on psilocybin in 1999. Psilocybin is the active ingredient of the so-called magic mushrooms. These studies began researching the effects of a psychedelic experience for people who are depressed, addicted to cigarettes, or dying of cancer. And the lead research was shocked because in the questionnaires collected a month after the studies, more than two-thirds of patients rate their psychedelic journey as one of the most important experiences of their life. In fact, about 50% say it's the single most spiritually significant experience of their life, on par with the birth of a child or the death of a parent. What this means is, a single experience with psilocybin is very powerful and significant. The same research found that psilocybin creates long-term measurable personality change, something traditionally thought to be a fixed after the mid-20s. It constantly made people score higher in traits related to openness and creativity. McKenna's theory is not that archaic apes ate mushrooms and their brains grew bigger. Rather, he thinks hallucinogenic experiences open their minds to novel ways of thinking, new patterns of behaving, and more complex expressions of language and culture. This might include more effective and coordinated hunting strategies. It might include shared religious beliefs, 
leading to more cohesive communities. It would especially would include new ways of using language. Psilocybin specifically activates the area of the brain concerned with processing signals. A common occurrence with psilocybin intoxication is spontaneous outbursts of poetry and other vocal activity such as speaking in tongues. The increasing complex nature of social life would have then created an evolutionary preference and selection pressure for humans with ever large brains and more mental power. In fact, in 1992, the British scientist Robin Dunbar became famous for showing a connection in primates between the size of the social groups and the relative size of their neocortex. The neocortex being the newest part of the brain used for processing complex information. So what Dunbar discovered is the neocortex is relatively small in primates that hang out in small tribes, like the Tamarkan monkey, which lives in groups of about five. But as you study primates living in larger and larger groups, you see their neurocortex has also been larger and larger. This led Dunbar to create what's known as the social brain hypothesis, which says humans evolved a complex brain to handle social relationships within the tribe, rather than to handle the outer environment as previously thought. Number three, prehistoric artifacts hint at ritual use of psychoactive plants. On a hard-to-reach plateau in Algeria, northern Africa, there's a place called Tazili Najer, which is a home to thousands upon thousands of ancient artworks. This place is now a desert, but 10,000 years ago when these cave paintings and engravings were created, the surroundings were a lush savanna, and many of the paintings portray large animals like antelopes and cattle herds. Other paintings show abstract geometric patterns of humans engaged in hunting and dancing. This place is seen as one of the most important centers of prehistoric art in the world. Looking at the image, you can see a rough drawing of the Mushroom Man. And one of the most striking paintings in Tassili Najer is a figure believed to be a shaman, wearing a mask, striped like a bee, and it looks like he's doing some kind of dance or ritual. But the most interesting part of this painting is that his hands appear to be full of mushrooms, and his body seems to be covered from head to toe in small mushrooms. That's not all. There's another painting in Tazili Najer of the so-called Mushroom Runners. Here's how Terence describes this second painting. The shamans are dancing with fists full of mushrooms and also have mushrooms sprouting out of their bodies. In one instance, they are shown running joyfully, surrounded by the geometric structures of their hallucinations. The pictorial evidence seems incontrovertible. Well, what could these paintings mean? What are these evidence of? Are they just regular mushrooms drawn for their interest in shape? Or could psychoactive mushrooms have been part of the rituals of these ancient people? And these are not the only prehistoric artworks that raise questions. Take, for example, the 6,000-year-old Salva Pascual mural near Spain. There is a clear shape of a horned bull, and at the bottom of it what appears to be a line of many small mushrooms. And in fact, a 2011 paper in the Journal of Economic Botany hypothesized these small mushroom shapes resemble a kind of psychoactive mushroom native to the area called Psilocybe Hispanica, the mystery of Soma. Now let's fast forward several thousand years to talk about the ancient and mysterious drink called Soma. First we need to mention the Rig Veda, which is one of the oldest religious texts in existence. Written down around 4,000 years ago, the Rig Veda is still a foundation of Hinduism today. Now the Rig Veda is split into 10 different books, which are called Mandalas. And here's something very fascinating, the ninth mandala, which makes up about 10% of this entire ancient text, is entirely dedicated to a mysterious drink called Soma and the religious rituals surrounding Soma. There are over 114 hymns praising the magical and healing properties of this drink. Here's an example of how they sound. It is drunk by the sick man as a medicine at sunrise, partaking of its strengths, the limbs, preserves the legs from breaking, wards off all disease, and lengthens life. The need and trouble vanish away. Pinching want is driven off and flees when the inspiring one lays hold of the mortal, the poor man, in the intoxication of the Soma. Feels himself rich, 
The draught impiles the singer to lift his voice and inspires him for song. It gives the poet supernatural power so that he feels himself immortal. Rig Veda translation is from the Food of the Gods book. In short, Soma sounds like a powerful, almost miraculous stuff. So what is it? That's the old mystery. Nobody really knows. The true identity of Soma was slowly forgotten over thousands of years of cultural and environmental changes. But recently, several scholars have tried to guess what the ancient drink was. The Rig Veda contains some hints. It says Soma was made from a mountain plant. Soma was also drunk before battles by warriors. So some scholars have speculated the drink was based on the plant Ophedra, which contains the powerful stimulant Ophedrin. Others argue cannabis must have been the main ingredient of Soma, or perhaps it was a plant called Paganum Hamala, which has psychoactive properties. In 1971, an author McKinnon highly respects called Gordon Watson published the book Soma, Divine Mushroom of Immortality, where he argued that a non-psilocybin mushroom called Amanita Mascara was the main ingredient in Soma. This mushroom, which is bright red with white spots, is an image most of us are very familiar with. It becomes the archetypal mushroom depicted in fairy tales and later even in the Super Mario Brothers and emojis. This mushroom contains two mind-altering neurotoxins called ipodenic acid and mosomol. Some people leave bits of this mushroom in milk to kill flies, earning it the name fly agaric. However, those who have tested consuming this mushroom, including Terence McKenna, himself found it not to give a positive experience. McKenna says the only effect he and his companions felt after eating it was nausea and sleepiness. Certainly nothing like what is described in the Rig Veda. But this book did open his mind to the possibility that Soma is based on a mushroom. The Rig Veda does say that cow is the embodiment of Soma, which implies a strong connection between the two. Cows themselves attain a sacred status in Hinduism, with their dung and urine used in rituals. Of course, psilocybin mushrooms grow in cow dung. Certainly psilocybin, which gives otherworldly hallucinogenic experiences, is one of the few substances which might live up to the ecstatic verses in the Rig Veda. Number 4. Several thousand years ago, humans shifted from partnership to dominated societies that emphasize hierarchy, conformity, and order. We all have a dim and distant, almost unconscious memory of a long lost paradise. Proof of this is the story of Adam and Eve, living in the lush, abundant Garden of Eden. The importance of this story can't be overstated. It's the foundational myth, the source code of Western culture. It's at the very beginning of the most widely read book of the past 2000 years. And while some people, especially those steeped in scientific materialism, would say the story is just a stale superstition designed to frighten people into obedience. Well, maybe there's more to it than that. Carl Jung would say the Adam and Eve myth arose out of humanity's collective unconscious. That's why the story speaks to something deep inside of us. It seems to communicate something about the nature of reality we feel to be intuitively true, even if some of our rational minds do not accept it as scientifically true. And what does it mean that the foundational book of Western civilization, right at the beginning, tells a story of humans finding and consuming a psychoactive plant? What does it mean that their eyes were then opened and they became self-conscious? As Terence McKenna jokes, this sounds like the story of history's first drug bust, with some prehistoric cultures based on partnership. What if the Garden of Eden was not just a myth? What if it represents a memory of a time that actually existed? When we look at some prehistoric cultures, we see an emphasis on respect for nature and all that is life-giving and nurturing. For example, Cities like Chartal Hurik on the island of Manua contained many female figurines, likely tributes to female fertility or goddesses that far outnumbered male ones. This is a stark contrast to the Abrahamic religions today that have always represented God as an old white bearded man. Looking at the image you can see Minoan snake goddess figurines. Terence McKenna says 7 to 10,000 years ago our archaic ancestors lived a very different society than most of us do today. Because of rituals involving psychoactive plants, 
they regularly experience oneness with nature and the dissolution of their personal ego. These experiences created the shift in values towards worship of the mother goddess and a more egalitarian, harmonious social structure. These are values typically connected to the feminine. But five to 7,000 years ago, invasions of warlike nomadic tribes brought an end to that era and shifted us to what could be described as dominator societies. These societies were now based on rigid hierarchy, authority, conformity, control, and they rely on violence to survive. The rise of the dominator societies. The plant-based and open-ended shamanistic spirituality of partnership societies was quickly suppressed and it was replaced with traditions of dogma and priestly hierarchies. The dominated social structures know intrinsically that altered states of consciousness are an existential threat to them. Why? Because certain plant rituals dissolve ego boundaries and help one see oneself as part of the interconnectedness web of life, a view tinted with the feminine. This religious shift led to new social and gender imbalances, wars, and as we are now seeing, the destruction of nature itself. Dominator societies also have a hostile attitude towards sexuality, another perfectly natural experience that is taboo because it dissolves ego boundaries. In all dominated societies, the relationship between men and women are centered on men being sought for security and apparent status. In partnership societies, this was less likely to happen because kids were raised in a more group-minded way and resources were more equally distributed among all members rather than accumulating to a few older males. What arose with dominated societies was monotheism. As McKenna describes it, monotheism exhibits what is essentially a pathological personality pattern projected onto the ideal of God. The pattern of the paranoid, possessive, power-obsessed male ego. This God is not someone you would care to invite to a garden party. Related to this is how much of a threat the medieval church saw in witchcraft. Just 400 years ago, the medieval followers of Christ were so terrified of witches, they murdered at least 30,000 of them through torture and burning. It's probably not a coincidence, most of those were female, as spiritual knowledge of the natural world is felt to be a feminine domain even today. As an aside, the plants used associated with European witchcraft like thorn apple, mandrake, and the nightshade are not hallucinogenic, but they are psychoactive in a way, producing states of delirium and derangement. That may explain the image of the mad, crackling witch. Number five, personal, social, and ecological balance in the world may be restored by shamanic plant rituals. Looking at the image, you can see an engraving from 1888. Albert Hoffman was a chemist working for a pharmaceutical company in Switzerland. In 1943, while researching different chemicals, he was the first person to synthesize lysergic acid, diethylamide, also known as LSD. He synthesized it and then forgot about it for years while World War II happened. After the war, he randomly returned to this chemical again and a small amount of LSD touched his skin. It triggered effects like a very active imagination and a sensitivity to light. It was then Hoffman knew he'd found something very peculiar. Three days later, on April 19, 1943, Hoffman intentionally ingested 250 micrograms of LSD. He thought this was a very small dose, but because LSD is so concentrated, it was actually a very high dose. LSD takes an hour or more to kick in, so Hoffman didn't feel the effects right away. After a while, he felt nothing, so he began riding his bike home from work, as is normal in Switzerland. Needless to say, in the middle of the bike ride, the hallucinogenic effects of LSD came on so strongly, he couldn't make it all the way. He said, It gave me an inner joy, an open-mindedness, a gratefulness, open eyes, and an internal sensitivity for the miracles of creation. I think that in human evolution, it has never been as necessary to have this substance, LSD. It is just a tool to turn us into what we are supposed to be. Albert Hoffman, speech on his 100th birthday in 2006. The Wild Experimental 60s A couple decades later, in 1960s, LSD went mainstream. 
probably due to the effects of figures like Timothy Leary, a controversial professor at Harvard. And the 1960s were an extraordinary window where sudden widespread use of psychoactive substances brought tremendous social change. An amount of social turbulence not seen in America in at least 100 years. Terence McKenna describes hallucinogens as deconditioning agents. They allowed the younger generation to see the relativity of cultural values and therefore the freedom not to conform to those values. At the same time, there was an explosion of new colours, music and art. The vibrant and groundbreaking music of the Beatles being a good example. Yet near the end of the 60s, the government panicked at what was happening and prohibited all psychedelics including those nobody even heard of at the time, like Ibogaine and Barofetine. This move was not based on any medical or scientific evidence. In fact, a lot of promising scientific research being done at the time was soon squeezed out of existence. For example, several clinics were using LSD to treat alcoholism and a recent meta-analysis of those studies found 59% of patients improved with the help of LSD, compared to 38% in the control group. Further, researchers noted how patients commonly felt that they had gained significant insights into their problems and been given a new lease of life. And they said this might have been the result of LSD binding with certain serotonin receptors in the brain, stimulating new connections and opening the mind to new possibilities. Nonetheless, psychedelics became taboo in the scientific world, and research was not funded into them for decades until very recently. In the past 10 years, there has been a kind of renaissance in psychedelic research led by Roland Griffiths at the John Hopkins University. His most well-known study up until now was giving psilocybin to terminally ill cancer patients. He found large and long-lasting decreases in depression and anxiety. Six months later, participants continued to report the improvements in quality of life. And that's from one dose of psilocybin, which is an unprecedented result. Ayahuasca and the Shamanic Experience Let's look at ayahuasca now. Ayahuasca is a particularly powerful psychoactive brew made by indigenous people living in the Amazon basins and it has a long shamanic tradition behind it. To make ayahuasca, you need two different plants. First, you need the leaves from the Psychotria via voidus plant, which contains dimethyltryptamine, or DMT for short. And you also need vines of another plant called Banisterios kcopi, which contains what's called MAO inhibitors. Now here's something crazy. Neither of these plants consumed alone does anything, but consumed together, the MAO inhibitors allow the DMT to enter the brain's serotonin receptors and create intense visionary experiences. How did the native people learn to boil these two specific plants together out of thousands in the Amazon? Nobody knows, and it's quite the mystery, especially considering the mechanism of MAO inhibition was not described by modern chemistry until the 1950s. And in the past 20 years, knowledge and interest in ayahuasca has increased among Americans and Europeans. And many centers have opened up in Peru and nearby countries, offering ayahuasca retreats mainly to Westerners. This rise in popularity may look a little strange when you know the effects of ayahuasca. First, the natives call it La Purja, or The Purge, because it induces intense vomiting and intermittent diarrhea, probably effective at purging tropical worms and parasites. The indigenous people consider the brew a general healing elixir, effective at clearing stuck emotional patterns and negative energy. Traditionally, ayahuasca is taken at a sacrament in the presence of a shaman. The shaman drinks the brew with you and sings magical songs called Icaros, meant to direct your hallucinogenic visions and ward off evil spirits. By all accounts, ayahuasca is an incredibly intense experience. Some people may imagine a euphoric high or a drunken stupor, but the effect is far more interesting and usually far less comfortable. As McKinnon describes it, the mind and the self literally unfold before one's eyes. There is a sense that one is made new, yet unchanged, as if one were made of gold and has been recast in the furnace of one's birth. McKenna says these kinds of archaic rituals are what's missing in modern society. Rituals or rites of passage that give us a vivid, direct experience of our connection 
to Mother Nature. Without these kinds of experiences, we become blind to the reality that we are in an interdependent relationship with the world. This kind of blindness is resulting in an ecological catastrophe, existential alienation, and social imbalance. And maybe the way out of these problems is not a political exhortation, but a return to the archaic rituals that shake each of us individually to our very roots. Number six, addiction is a serious problem, and hallucinogens may help curb it. When talking about psychoactive substances, it's important to talk about addiction. The word drug itself is an overly broad and imprecise category, but let's look at the dominant social attitude towards drugs anyway. Those who advocate a war on drugs see them as a corrupting influence that if allowed to exist will spread like an infection across the population, trapping masses of people into a hedonistic, obsessive and endless chase for selfish gratification. For example, we all know heroin is one of the most addictive drugs. More importantly, heroin addicts are scary people. There's a reason they are called dope fiends. The de definition of a fiend is an evil spirit or demon. So heroin addicts are seen as possessed by some evil demon. McKenna says, the face of evil is the face of total need. When someone is in the grips of a heroin addiction, they are in a total need which means they will do practically anything for their next dose, including lying, cheating, stealing, betraying their friends, or worse. Just as a rabid dog cannot control itself, a heroin fiend is also to some extent controlled and helpless. From this perspective, it makes sense that people would want to fight a war on a substance like this. Of the good in you, I can speak, but not of the evil. For what is evil but good tortured by its own hunger and thirst. Virally, when good is hungry, it seeks food even in dark caves, and when it's thirsty, it drinks even of dead waters. From the book, The Prophet, addiction increases with new methods of distillation. But let's step back in time for a moment. Opium has been consumed by people for thousands of years. The earliest evidence of poppy seed pods in human settlements in Spain dates back 4,200 years. In fact, most of the ancient civilizations used opium medically, recreationally, or both. This includes the ancient Sumerians, Egyptians, Greeks, Romans, Arabs, and more. It was used medically as a strong form of pain relief, even mentioned in the most important early medical text 3,550 years ago. It also carries a reputation as an aphrodisiac and male potency enhancer in many places. Yet despite this widespread use, there is virtually no mention of opium addiction in old text. Well, for most of history, opium was not injected or even smoked. The sticky resin from poppy flower seed pods was either dissolved in wine or swallowed as a pellet. It was only in 1805 that a young German chemist, Friedrich Sauterner, isolated the active alkaloid in the poppy plant. He named it morphine after the Greek god of dreams, Morpheus. And according to the DEA, morphine is 10 times more powerful than processed opium, quantity for quantity. Then in 1853, the hypodermic syringe was invented, giving doctors a way to inject doses of morphine quickly and efficiently. It was so common for soldiers returning from war to be addicted to morphine that some journalists began calling it the soldier's disease. By 1888, Opioids made up 15% of all prescriptions in Boston, and throughout the 1870s and 80s, medical journals began filling with warnings about the danger of morphine addiction. This grew into post-Civil War opium epidemic that peaked around 1903. Many believed it eventually subsided due to the changes in doctors' prescribing behavior. McKinnis says this is a dark pattern that drugs take as technology evolves. The new drugs are even more concentrated, potent, and addictive than what came before. That brings us to the modern opioid epidemic happening in America and many other industrialized countries. Heroin, as the first semi-synthetic opioid, replaced morphine for most addicts when it was introduced. And the dramatic surge in overdose deaths starting in 2010s is due to fentanyl, an even more concentrated and dangerous synthetic opioid. From the year 2000 to 2016, the overdose rate in US quadrupled, 
mainly because of fentanyl and similar new substances. Looking at the image, you can see drugs involved in US overdose deaths from 1999 to 2017, drug overdose deaths according to the US Institute of Health. As another example of this pattern, hear what McKenna says based on his research into the use of alcohol. Humans use alcohol in the form of fermented grains, juices, and mead is extremely ancient. Distilled spirits, in contrast, were not known to the ancients. Alcoholism, as a social and community problem, appears to have been rare before the discovery of distillation. A new tool for ending addiction. This being the reality, we need to take the problem of addiction seriously. And this means putting aside failed approaches that have failed miserably in the past like prohibition. It's ironic in a way that hallucinogenic plants may represent a future path out of addiction. A recent pilot study done by John Hopkins tried giving one dose of psilocybin in a therapeutic setting to 15 people who had reportedly failed to quit cigarettes. Most of the patients quit smoking and after six months, they found that 80% of the subjects continued to be abstinent. The head researcher of this study was Roland Griffiths, who we've mentioned a couple times already. When asked about these positive results, he said, People who have taken psilocybin appear to have a more confidence in their ability to change their own behavior and to manage their addictions. Prior to this experience, quite often the individual feels that they have no freedom relative to their addiction, that they are hooked and they don't have the capacity to change. But after an experience of this sort, which is like backing up and seeing the larger picture, they begin to ask themselves, why would I think that I couldn't stop cigarette smoking? Roland Griffin's scientist at John Hopkins. The false dichotomy of substance and behavioral addiction. Now let's take a step back. What is addiction anyway? Defined in the broadest way, an addiction is something that causes compulsive behavior. In fact, to see addiction only as a consumption of certain substances is a very narrow view. Therefore, McKenna proposes a new definition of drug as something that causes unexamined, obsessive, and habitual behavior. If our goal is to thrive collectively as a society, then we need to examine all sources of these compulsive and destructive behavior patterns. Take television for example. We've all heard the shocking statistic before that most people spend four to six hours per day watching television. Of course, now the internet and mobile devices have somewhat replaced television. And according to a 2018 Nelson report, the average adult now spends over 11 hours every day watching or interacting with media. This habit has many destructive effects, deteriorates relationships, harms health, and erodes attention spans. But beyond that, television and other media also make us into consumers of the images other people feed us. As McKenna says, television is by nature the dominator drug par excellence. Control of content, uniformity of content, Repeatability of content make it inevitably a tool of coercion, brainwashing, and manipulation. Even worse, these digital addictions seem to be following a similar trend as the physical drugs. Over time, they are becoming more potent. We went from a weekly newspaper to a daily news hour, to now our phones constantly buzzing in our pockets. Is there any way out of this? Well, Decades before the term psychedelic caught on, these plants were called consciousness expanding. Aldous Huxley wrote about how they opened the doors of perception and helped him reconnect with the world as it is, including deeper self-reflection. And if Terence McKenna is right, and consciousness expanding plants accidentally opened the doors of perception for us homo sapiens thousands of years ago, then perhaps after being slammed shut for so long, the door is creaking open again, and maybe this time, in contrast to the wild 1960s counterculture, these archaic sacraments can be reintroduced on a solid foundation and become an integral part of the future mental health and individual religious inquiry. Our addictions down through the ages from sugar to cocaine and television have been a relentless search for the thing torn from us in paradise. The answer has been found, it is no longer something to be sought. It has been found. And that's a wrap on this book, 
Food of the Gods by Terence McKenna. If you like this and want the summary in a PDF format, click the link below where I can send you this to you via email. Now, if you don't know us, we are Best Book Bids. We've done over 700 book summaries in video, written, and audio format. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Spotify, and check out our website, bestbookbits.com. Now, if you're sick and tired of reading and learning all by yourself, I have a solution for you. I have created the Best Book Club, which is a book club where you'll get one new book per month. You'll meet an author of the month through our live webinar, seminar, Q&A series, and we have weekly catch-up Zoom meetings where you will learn the lessons of the book of the month from the readers in the club. Meet 24 new friends, join the club now, click the link below to join, or go to bestbookbits.com forward slash book club. Can't wait to meet you there. Thanks for watching and listening. Hope you got something from